Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for watching and listening. This is a special joint simulcast of Zoom Into Books and the Big Time Talker podcast on the Blog Talk Radio Network, brought to you by our friends at speakermatch.com. Special thanks to Kathy Teets and all the gang at Headline Books for letting me speak to a broadcasting legend. And legend is not just code for old guy. This is a guy <laughs> who's really done uh, a lot in his decades in the broadcasting business that well, we can all be somewhat envious of. Lou Dobbins has served for many years as one of the leading country music advocates in the Appalachian Mountain region. He's uh, been on many, many radio stations, many TV stations, and the awards have come back to him uh, in a large way. He's both a member of the West Virginia Broadcasters Hall of Fame and the West Virginia Country Music Hall of Fame. And if there was a big name country artist from the 60s, 70s, 80s, or 90s, chances are they've shared a microphone with Lou Dobbins. And that's what I get to do today as well. Lou, thank you so much for being on the program. Burr, thank you so much. It is really an honor and a privilege to be with you and your audience. I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. And I know during the course of whatever time we have, we will be educational and entertaining. And we're going to lean on the entertainment piece. I'll tell you, I, uh, I actually have, and I will hold it up here right now, a mm -hmm. copy of Behind the Microphone. It, it's, uh, this is one of those books that you want to put on your coffee table if you're a music fan, uh, especially country music fan. For somebody like you that's been at it since the early 1960s, you've lived an amazing life. And I want to start, if we can, back at the beginning. Um, as a kid, were you in a, a musical household? Talk to me about being little Lou Dobbins and, uh, and what that was like. There wasn't, Burke, a lot of music in my home. My uncle, now he played guitar. He played at square dances. But other than that, there wasn't that much music in my home. The music that was made in my home was with me and a transistor radio blaring up to about 110 degrees. But what I would do late at night under the covers of my bed, I had an Arvin transistor radio in my left hand, flashlight in my right hand, and I would be up for all hours of the morning, and I seen New York City, I could see Chicago, I could see Nashville, I could see all these locations, and I said to myself, I've got to do that. I've got to be the guy behind the mic. So it was a dream that started listening to these overnight radio personalities. So as soon as I graduated from high school, I, uh, I got into the wild and wonderful business of show business. And back in those days, those huge uh, clear channel radio stations, as you said, you could hear them all over the country. Uh, and, and those legendary disc jockeys, you know, the Wolfman Jacks of the world, uh, uh, Hoss Allen down in Nashville, and, and you know, all the guys from WLS in Chicago. You came of age in, in the 1960s. And, and I wonder if, as a kid of the 1960s coming up, um, were you uh, into to early rock and roll as much as you were country? Or at what point did the country? music be your guiding voice? Burke, I tell you, I, uh, when I was growing up, there, there was two kinds of fans. There was the rock fan, there was the country fan. With right. me, I was a fan of both, both musics. I always had an open mind. It was always good or it was bad. And I got teased a lot for that because many of my friends were listening to rock and roll and thought country was too hillbillish, didn't want any part of it. But I grew up predominantly on, on rock and roll and country together. And as time went on, country, it got me more involved than what rock and roll did, even though I did start at a rock and roll radio station. But uh, I, I got out of that field of music, not to say that I didn't like it. I still like it today. If it's good, it's good. If it's bad, it's bad. But country had more of a, a personality to it. Uh, the country singers were more down to earth, uh, people you could exchange comments and views with. I fell in love with not only the music, but the entertainers. I, I always wanted to know more about that person on the turntable that was rolling around. The music was great, but what's that person like? I thought my audience would like it, and they, and they liked it. They responded, so I started doing interviews along with the music. So country, it was just something that it evolved into that, that I thought that my life's calling should be that, that profession. You want to learn more about Lou and his incredible career and, and the dozens, hundreds of famous entertainers who's interviewed, pick up a copy of Behind the Microphone at headlinebooks.com, amazon.com, or wherever books are sold. Let's go back to your very, very first radio show, and, and I want you to, to sort of paint that picture for us. How old were you the first time you were on the air, and do you remember 
Were you were you nervous? Did you have butterflies? Were you excited? Tell me about that very first radio show. Well, I, I tell you, the, the first job in the business, and then I'll get to the radio, was in TV. I couldn't find a job in radio anywhere. I didn't have experience. And the, the old managers and the old veterans said, you've got to have experience. So I got with these local broadcasters, and we had many very good broadcasters. And they taught me, and I listened. I'd record. They'd listen to what I had to say. And I, I heard of an opening at WDTV Channel 5 for a live booth announcer. Now, back then, Burke, they didn't use tape. Uh, videotape was very sparingly used. Commercials were on slides, a read-over. All the commercials were in black and white film, and they were needing a live booth announcer. So that was the first job I took. You got it right the first time, or you didn't get it right, but you kept on plunging through it, whatever it turned out, it turned out. But I did that for about six months. And uh, then I entered into radio, and it was a rock and roll radio station. And I loved the cities for rock and roll. It was music that said something, that meant something. Uh, not like today. And uh, I wasn't, no, I wasn't nervous at all. It was something that I had trained for all my life under the covers of a bed and uh, an Auburn radio, uh, a flashlight, and I would record myself over and over and over imitating these guys. And I would read scripts. And I'd let other guys hear it, and they would they would uh, they would uh, school me on it. But uh, the so radio station you said that was right out of high school. So you're 17, 18 years old. I'm 17 years old. And 17 years old was the first job at Channel Five. I was 18 when I went to work for uh, for WHAR, a thousand watt uh, AM first radio station in the market to go all rock and roll. And and, and you mentioned the term booth announcer. So. That's something that, that doesn't really exist today. What would a booth announcer at a TV station do? Can you give me an example? Booth announcer, anything that pertains to words on the television stations, commercials, PSAs, you read live and you were timed. If it was a 30-second PSA, public service announcement, you read for 30 seconds. They didn't see you. They just saw what was on the TV. And on the left hand of the, of the screen here was the first job at WDTV Channel 5 with that big uh, big message board in front of me. But you announced everything, Burke. If it was, uh, if it was commercials, uh, PSAs, anything that involved words, you did, you did it live. And it was live as can be. And there were some pretty ticklish moments <laughs> live as can be. <laughs> what, what year was that? What year did you graduate from high school and take a job? I graduated from 60, that was 66, 66. I worked uh, for the for the uh, TV station at first, then went on to work the rock and roll. And that was the real rock and roll back then. I was playing uh, people like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and uh, the Motown artists. Uh, there was the Shirelles, Diana the Ross. Patients, the Supreme, Patients, all, those guys. All, all this music, all this music made sense. And that's that's what I, that I worked. And then out of that, then I branched on into country music after that. Now, I'm just curious if you can remember any of the television shows that you might have introduced on WDTV, would you have said tonight at eight on Gilligan's Island or whatever the show might be? That's, it, that's exactly what I do tonight at seven o'clock on WDTV channel five. It's Gilligan's Island, eight o'clock, blah, blah, blah. Don't miss it. And all the time that I'm doing this work, I'm looking at the clock. I got 15, 20 or 30 seconds to get that in. I got a director and we're on headsets and he's timing it down. But uh, they would be promos like uh, tonight, uh, stay tuned to Channel 5. We have all these various shows that you want to watch, and I promote those shows live. There was no tape. It was all lives that happened. You played records. And, and uh, Lou, I've got a 15-year-old son who uh, only a year ago, when, when I uh, broke out the record player, he was fascinated by records. He didn't know how they worked. He literally mm -hmm. said, Dad, what do I do with this? And, and how does it work? But you must have played and probably own thousands of vinyl records. I have a collection of vinyl records. I, in fact, I had to uh, have a, a building <laughs> built onto the attachment of my house to get all my music in there. Of course, back in the day when I first started, you had the eight track recordings, which wasn't recorded for on air, but you had the vinyls, you had the 45 RPM, the 33 and the third RPM. And that's the way you played your music. You played them through a, a control board we would cue up the record, and that means you take the, the uh, record and cue it to the first sound that comes out. So when you announce 
Here is George Jones. As soon as the Jones ends, boom, the record comes on. And uh, it was the 33 and the 45s for – I kept hanging on to them until 1989. I was still playing them. And they got to the point and – I was, and I was very – Larry of the CDs, it was something new, Burke, and I really, I didn't know about it. I knew my vinyl, but I didn't know the CD. But I had to go to the CD because the record company said, Lou, if you don't start playing CDs, you're not going to get any music. So I had to go to the CDs, and now after all these years, and even looking back now, it was a, the CD, just a great, great way to create music. You know, much easier to, to control, much easier to handle, and the quality is superb. So he CDs is our guest, and, and we're talking about his incredible career in broadcasting, spanning almost five decades now. He's a uh, Country Music Hall of Famer, and also a member of the West Virginia Broadcasters Hall of Fame. The book is behind the microphone, and one of the things I thought was was fascinating about your story is I read through it. You not only played these songs on the radio and continue to after all these years, you also were a songwriter. I wrote songs. Now, that, there's a picture on the screen now. That was my promo picture. Now, wasn't I a handsome young lad? Look at that. That, hair, at that, hair. that, that hairdo is just absolutely fantastic. I wear the hat now. As long as they create hats, I'll be all right. Huh. But uh, I, I, was, I was writing songs. I was a factory. I was under a, a writer's contract in, uh, in Nashville. Nothing ever happened out of it. But I got into the studio one time with a Farron Young song and another time with Jerry Lee Lewis. But they didn't, didn't record them. But, the, but I wrote and I wrote and I wrote. And that picture is, uh, is me when I was writing and performing. We had so many country music acts that came through Clarksburg, West Virginia, my base home. 99.9% .9 of the time, I would go out and, and try to warm up the crowd with two or three numbers. So that's the promo picture there. And I still write some. In fact, in my book, uh, Burke, there's a number of songs that I have written. The lyrics are in, in, the, uh, in the book. And, and some of them, I think uh, people will find them very interesting. Songs that never got recorded. Well, they were recorded by me. And that's, <laughs> but, but there's some good lyrics in those books. In fact, I think in the book, a lot of those songs would make good poems. You, uh, you just mentioned your hometown, Clarksburg, West Virginia. You and I have West Virginia in common. That's my, my home state, and, and you've made a long uh, career there. And that's one of the, the hubs of country music. And I, I wonder how much you think that Appalachian influence that you grew up around influenced your, your love of that music, that music that is just such a vital, integral part of people's existence back there. Oh, it, it was, and there wasn't, like I said, a lot of music in my house, but there was music everywhere. There were music festivals, country music events. Uh, locally, in, 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 I was really raised in western West Virginia, up on McCann's Run, which Clarksburg is my base home now, but as a small youngster, it was up on McCann's Run. And there were two radio stations that had block programming. One minute you might hear uh, uh, middle of the road music, which would be a Nat King Palmer and Andy Williams. Next minute you might hear a rock and roll. The next minute you hear a country. But they had sections of programming for country, and it was real country music. And those two radio stations I listened to. I knew exactly when they came on, and I would click because they came on at different times. I would cling to those songs and all the songs around me. And it was it was country music. It was music that said something music that meant something so yeah the influence was all around me and you know just something that uh that just took a hold of me and to this day hasn't let go and i'm glad it hasn't i wonder if uh if we could ask you uh about some of these these many entertainers that that you have interviewed down through the years and, and the list is so long we'll never get through all of them but i want to ask you about some specific folks that i know you've spoken with because they're real legends in country music. And I'd like to start with, with Glenn Campbell, a guy who was, uh, you know, a, a very underrated guitarist. He was actually a touring guitarist for the Beach Boys, incredible singer, songwriter. What do you remember about your conversation with Glenn Campbell? Well, Glenn Campbell, I've been trying to get an interview with Glenn Campbell for several months. This is when I worked at a full-time country music radio station, WPDX, the first station to go all country in this market. And I kept trying and trying. And, you know, I sort of was getting the run around. You can do it here, but he can't do it then. But, but 
one day I got a hold of his manager and I said, I'd like to do this, this interview with Glenn. And he got with Glenn and Glenn consented to do the interview. And at the time, Glenn was performing in, uh, in Las Vegas. So I called Las Vegas, which was uh, nine o'clock our time. And uh, we did a phone interview from, from Las Vegas. He just got through playing tennis with a longtime comedian talk show host, Joey Bishop. So he come up and on the phone and we talked. And I, I remember specifically talking about True Grit and how he and John Wayne had developed such a great friendship and how he taught him how to act. He never gave him a rough time. If he messed up, John would put his arm around him and say, hey, that's all right, son. It's all part of the process. We'll just do it again. And also, Glenn had a very popular TV program, the Glenn Campbell Good Time Hour. That's and right. I asked him about that. I said, did you enjoy doing that show? Because, you know, I've heard artists tell me that it really gets to be a grind. And he said he enjoyed the first two years. But the last year, which was the final year of the show, they canceled him. He did not enjoy it because they fired all the writing staff, brought in new writers, and they were writing a show, not around Glenn Campbell, but they were writing a show. The writers before wrote the show around Glenn, and now they were, they were not writing, writing, writing directly to Glenn and putting him in as a star of the show. So he didn't, he didn't care for that at all. And at the time, he was uh, putting together a new stage show, which involved bagpipes. And uh, he did a good time Glenn Campbell imitation for me. Hi, this is Glenn Campbell. And uh, he, was, he was just a great guy, saddened so much to see what happened to him. He was brilliant. They're, they're, they're in the category of guitar players, there's many great ones, Burke, but Glenn Campbell would, would be right there on the top rung of the ladder. He was an incredible guitarist. He started out, as you know, as a session guitar player with a group they called The Crew. And they did all the recordings out on the West Coast of all the stars, including the Beach Boys. And what they would do, they would come into the studio and without their instruments. And Glenn Campbell and the crew would do all the instrumentals for the song. And after the recording session, then the band or individual would have to learn that song because their instruments were not permitted in the studio. And Glenn and Leon Russell and people like that were a big part of the crew. And uh, they, they, uh, they played the music for the stars. And of course, Glenn was so talented it was just a matter of time before he had his own show and his own recording contract and he was just a great guy i remember him well what about george jones george jones one of those artists that uh boy he could uh, in west virginia certainly could walk on water i actually saw him perform there in, in the state several times uh, a guy who could do no wrong had his own personal demons but boy could sing a song like no other George Jones would rate right at the top of the scale as one of the great country music singers of all time. And also another part that's overshadowed, George also was a fine writer. He, he wrote, uh, wrote several hit records back in the early days. Uh, Why Baby Why, which was the number one record. George wrote that song. And like you said many times, the demons that he had, and he certainly had them overshadowed his singing. But when he was straight, there was, there was not a better country singer, nice guy, quiet guy. Uh, he was just, uh, what, do you, what more can you say about George? He was a, a living legend, and he'll go down in the same pathways of a, of a Hank Williams in, in years to come. When we look back at the genre of country and our grandkids look back, George would be right there at the top of the list. And uh, even though sometimes his antics overshadowed his, his music, he was, uh, he was fantastic, fantastic. What about George's uh, wife for a time, who was a country legend in her own right, Tammy Wynette? What do you recall about your conversations with her? Tammy Wynette, uh, she was a, a plain-spoken woman. Uh, George was kind of quiet. He didn't have a lot to say, unless he had a few belts within him. But now, uh, uh, Tammy was a real pistol. I remember one show we did in Clarksburg, West Virginia. George would go out and do his part. Then he'd bring out Tammy to do some duets. So Tammy had this brand new pair of shoes she just bought for the show, and they were red. She had a beautiful red dress on, and these shoes, she went out and performed, and she came back, these, feet, these shoes were killing her feet. She pulled off those shoes and slammed them up against the wall, said a few short words, and told her assistant to go out and get her a new pair of shoes because she couldn't stand those shoes that were killing her feet. So we went out and got, got new show, shoes, and she went on out and, and did the show. I did an interview with Tammy about George. It's in the book. 
And uh, it's, it's, it's a story of two sides. George had his side, Tammy had her side. But uh, uh, the life of Tammy Wynette was just absolutely, it, it was a dream of, of stardom and greatness and also was a, was a, was a very tragic life. Uh, Tam, or, uh, Tammy got hooked on pain pills. She was an addict. Uh, she was taking pain pills, as her daughter Georgette told me after the day she died. But she never let that overshadow her talent. Uh, her second marriage uh, was, was a disaster. And uh, she was often uh, often abused, but she still was Tammy Wynette and and uh, was always one of the true queens of country music. And there's there's a whole chapter about George and Tammy. The first time I met them, and then later on in life when when I, when I met them separately. Conway Twitty. Now there's a, a voice that uh, if you were a country music fan, certainly in the 1970s, 19 early 1980s. You couldn't escape Conway Twitty on your country music radio station. The guy was Conway, ever Con, Conway Twitty, real name Harold Jenkins. He got his name from two cities and two states: Conway, Arkansas; Twitty, Texas. Came out to Conway Twitty. I did several shows with Conway. I remember one night it was late, and we're riding in between shows, and of course we're talking music. And I asked Conway, I said, "What what's been the biggest record? And the biggest record at that time." It's always, or uh, it's only make believe, which was a big crossover country here. And I asked Conway, what, what is your success formula? And he said, Lou, when I write a song, when I record, I always take the woman and I put her on a pedestal. She is the queen, crown and all. And I take that boyfriend or that husband and I kick him in the dirt and I stomp him. I put that woman first. Therefore, she brings her husband or her boyfriends to buy my records and to see my shows. My <laughs> success, formula, success formula, you put the woman on top and everything will be fine. Uh, Conway right. Twitty never missed a show Burke in his life. He never missed a concert because of illness. One night I worked a show with him. He had the flu so bad that his manager didn't want him to do the show. I said, Conway, you can't do that. You're too ill. Conway said, I paid to do it and I'll do it. He walked out on stage, and as soon as the spotlight hit Conway, it was like nothing was wrong with him. He put on a fantastic show. After the show, he collapsed. They tried to get him to the bus, but he wouldn't go to the bus. He wanted to sign autographs in the condition that he was in. Now, this is a man that didn't have to do that. He could have went right to the bus and said, see you later and love your neighbor. But uh, he wanted to sign the autographs, and this building held about 3,000, and it was full. And he stayed there until every autograph was signed. And that told me so much about Conway Twitty and the love for his fans. He, uh, he was just a gentleman on and off stage. Uh, I miss him a lot. I, I was shocked when he, when he died at such a young age. And, but uh, there's a lot in the book more than that about, about Conway and, and our friendship. The book is from my friend Lou Dobbins, and he's a, a Hall of Fame broadcaster. You'll love it if you're a country music fan. Behind the Microphone talks about just all of these different artists that, that Lou has interviewed down through the years. And uh, highly recommend it. It's available from headlinebooks.com and, of course, uh, amazon.com, barnesnoble.com, wherever you, you can find books. Um, I want to ask you this because I just had this conversation with an attorney friend a couple of weeks ago who grew up back there in West Virginia. And he said, you know, when I was a kid growing up in small town, West Virginia, he said, I hadn't thought about it for a long time, but, but something you just said, Lou, reminded me of that. He said, the biggest country artist in the country would come to my small town. I saw some of the most famous entertainers ever come to, uh, you know, Golly Bridge, West Virginia, or the Armory in Beckley, West Virginia. That's something that, that was unique to country music artists in the, the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. You didn't have to go to a major metropolitan area to see them. And, and I wonder if that was your experience there in Clarksburg, which is by no means a huge city, but it seems like the biggest of the big made it to your town. Back in the day, Burke, these country artists, now this is back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, up into the 80s when I was really, really involved with country music. They were so sincere. They loved their fans so much. And they accommodated the fans and the promoter with, with their ticket price. Not like the rock and rollers who were charging an arm and a leg for a ticket. And when the show was over, they were gone. But yeah, you would see some of the biggest entertainers in the world right here in Clarksburg. I mean, it, it housed some of the 
the biggest ones, Charlie Daniels, Conway Twitty, Loretta Lynn, George and Tammy, Farron Young. I mean, it went on for forever with the biggest names in country because they formed their price around the community that they were playing. They were playing a small town. They had so much love for their fans that they accommodated their fans with a ticket price that they could afford. And that's, that's the way it was. And I experienced that oh, for, for many years, especially in the 60s and 70s. Fair and young, you would uh, mention to me right before we went on the air, uh, actually uh, ran afoul of the law right there in Clarksburg, West Virginia. Tell us that story. Oh, I, I love Fair and Young. Fair and Young, he was a dynamite entertainer, great singer of song. But uh, Farron had this wild side where he really liked to drink. And he did not only drink, he, he drank heavily. And during shows, you drink during shows. What's that, Bert? You drink during shows. Oh, he drink during shows, oh, yeah. Bad shape and go downhill from there. Exactly. Well, this, this happened on a Sunday afternoon. It was a two-show event. Farron did the afternoon show, then did the night. And at the time, he had a big hit record titled This Little Girl of Mine. And what he would do, he would close his show by going out into the audience and going to a little girl and ask the little girl to come on stage and sing so he could sing the song to her, this little girl of mine, touching song. So the first show went, went great. The little girl came up on stage, and all the men and the women, they were crying. I mean, it was just so, so touching. I was back at the radio station at the time, and they were all just crying and crying. The station manager was at that show, and he came back to me, went live on the air, and said, ladies and gentlemen, you got to go out tonight and see Farron Young. He's one of the greatest country music entertainers that ever performed, and this radio station is proud to be a sponsor of Farron Young. Okay. Second show comes, comes to the end of the show, time for this little girl of mine. Barry goes out into the audience. And this is after the station manager said, you've got to see this guy. He's a, he's a family man. Oh, it's a family show. He goes, this little girl, she didn't want to go. She spit on him, pulled the microphone out of his hand, and he hauled off and spanked her about three times, threw her down into the chair. Well, oh. about that time, <laughs> true story. I was there for that second show. And the, the crowd starts coming to the stage. I mean, there's a near riot going to break out. And Farron threw the microphone down, said he didn't want to do this blankly to blankly show anyway. So he stormed off, left his band members to fend for him. He jumped on his bus and got the heck out of Dodge. But a few miles out of town, he was arrested for assault. And uh, he paid a fine that night. And then there was the civil proceedings. The family sued him. And they, they settled out of court, whatever that amount was. It was an amount that wasn't disclosed. But that was a sign of Farron, and that wasn't the first time that things like that has happened. It happened. Gene Shepard refused to work with Farron because of the fact they did a show one night, and he got in a fight. It was an FOP show. got in a fight with the Turn Order Police uh, law enforcement officers, and they rolled out on the stage during her performance, and she said that was the last show ever worked with Farron. Loved Farron. Farron was Farron, but he, uh, he had that, that wild streak, and that episode in Clarksburg was one of his really, really bad wild streaks. We're talking about country music and just the, the list goes on and on of the artists that, that you spent time with and have, have entertained with, you know, from George Strait to, uh, actually, I'm just looking at some of the pictures of the book there, Marty Stewart, and I could just go on and on and on, and, and we never get to the end of the list. There's Lyle Lovett. I, I wonder if if there is an artist that that is sort of the top of the list for you when it comes to being a genuinely nice guy or nice lady. Somebody look back on and go, you know what, even if this person were not a famous entertainer, I'd love to just spend time with that person. They were just good people. There's one that immediately comes to mind. I don't have to close my eyes to think about it. And that would have to be Charlie Daniels. Charlie and I did so many interviews together. We did so many shows together. I'm still trying to come to terms with his death, but he was one of those guys. Charlie always knew where his bread was buttered. If you wanted a radio interview with Charlie, he made the time to do that radio interview because we always promoted his latest project at the time. And he was so sincere. He was the same on stage as what he was off stage. He was a friend. He was a guy you'd go out to dinner with and, and, and have a nice evening. I tell you, the first time I met Charlie Daniels, this was in the mid 70s, and uh, the radio station I was working at was right down the hill from a Sheraton hotel. And we had been promoting for a month 
Charlie Daniels coming to town. So I just happened to be back in the back room with the radio station, looked out, and in and, and the entranceway of the hotel, there's two big buses, says the Charlie Daniels band. And boy, here's my chance. I'm going to go up and meet Charlie, get him out of the station, go and interview Charlie. It's about 74, 75. So I go into the hotel, and I hear this large disturbance. I mean, words are flying, tempers are hot. And I go to the desk clerk, and I said, what's going on here? He said they denied Charlie Daniels and the band access to the dining room. And I said, why? He said, they, are, they are not in proper attire. <laughs> now, yeah, now, look, now, with Charlie Daniels and his boys, that's the way they dressed. That's the way they lived. They, and, and that's just the way it was. But they weren't going to let them eat in that dining room. So they had to order meals to their room. Now, here's the kicker. Charlie's coming out. And he's screaming. And I knew it was the, the worst time in the world to introduce myself to Charlie Daniels in the mood he was in. But I jumped right in the middle of the fracas and introduced myself. And he stopped. He said, you work in country radio? I said, yeah, just down the street. You can see our station from here. I'd love for you to come down and have an interview. He said, well, I'll, I'll try to get down there. He said, what do you think about this place? Don't let me in to eat. And I said, well, I think they're all crazy. I said, There's something wrong with them, Charlie. And please take my apology. I know you, you're the way you are, and, and it's terrible, but this happened. He said, well, it wasn't the first time. So <laughs> anyway, I went back to the radio station, told him Charlie was coming down. They all laughed. Charlie Daniels won't be down here. He just told you that to get rid of you. Uh, about an hour later, Charlie came through the door. We sat down and did our first interview. And we talked about the, the days preceding his stardom days. And really, in 74, 75, he was a star, but he wasn't that big star yet. Right. We talked about his musician days where he played guitar for Bob Dylan, Marty Robbins and all the session work and oh he was just a wonderful wonderful man you talk to anybody that had ever been around Charlie Daniels in their life and they'll tell you that whether they had any verbal conversations with him or just he signed an autograph for him he was and what a what a talented individual Burke this man could play oh he, he played the guitar so well and the fiddle and a personality that wouldn't quit he could he was one of the best storytellers that that I've ever been around in my life. Charlie Daniels, one of the great ones. And he, he was right up there as one of my favorites. I uh, hated to lose him this year. Lou Dobbins is our guest today. The book is behind the microphone. It's a big coffee table sized book that, that if you're a country music fan, you'll certainly enjoy uh, all the many, many stories of the different country music legends and icons that Lou has spent time with. You know, Lou, I, I wanted to ask you, you, you uh, of course, primarily to me known as as this legendary radio guy for all these interviews that you've done. But you had something of a dual career for many years. You did television and radio. And I wonder if, if one of those two mediums was, was more fun, more interesting than the other, or did you enjoy them both? Scott, I liked TV. I really did like TV, but I loved radio. And there's a big difference between like and, and love. In TV, you are so restricted on the time element. I was a news director. Started out as a producer, then newsman, then news director. And I would start working on a news broadcast with my crew at 7 o'clock in the morning. And we'd work right up to 6 o'clock, the evening news. And all day of working, all the filming, all the interviews, when it was all said and done, we had approximately every evening 18 minutes of on-air time. Now, that included not only news, that included sports and that included weather. Right. So you work all day for that. And then you turn around, you do it again at 11 o'clock. I liked it, but I couldn't be myself. I had to be the, as you see there, a suit and tie guy. And that wasn't me, but I, I played the part. But uh, then I got into radio and I said, like, man, this is, this is, I can do a three and four hour radio show, be myself, talk to my fans, play, play the music that I love, country music. And, uh, I thought I could be such, in radio, be more creative than on TV. And radio can be a lot more difficult than creativity in TV because in radio, you've got to paint the picture. You've got to have the person looking at whatever you're talking about. TV, it's a lot of, it's, it's mostly visual and you don't need all that extra emphasis because you're seeing what you're seeing. But uh, radio, I just, I just loved it. I stayed with it all these years and I still love it today, but Burke, it's, it's difficult for me to listen to, uh, to, to the music of today. It's just so difficult. It's, I'm old school. That's just the way I am. And it's just, 
there's no personality there. It's just, I, I, and the music I'm not really into. Some of it I like, most of it I don't. But it's not like the old time on air Lou Dobbins on the radio. You call me up, you need to hear something, I'll play it for you. Your wish is my command. You know, things like that, you don't hear it anymore. And it, that's disappointing to me. It really, really, really is. In fact, I couldn't, I'd have a, if I, well, I couldn't work today's radio. Oh, no, I, I'd, I'd be fired the first day. I'd, I'd, <laughs> I'd throw the rule book out the window and I'd be myself. He's a rebel. Be rebel. Lou Dobbins is a rebel with a book and a microphone. Yeah. Uh, and the book is behind the microphone, by the way, from our friends at Headline mm-hmm. Books. It's available now at headlinebooks.com. You can also, of course, go to Amazon at Barnes and Noble. Uh, dot com and pick it up and lose our guest today on Zoom into Books and our, our podcast, the Big Time Talker podcast. Um, I see a picture uh, in the book of you and Ray Stevens. Now, we talked a, a lot about Charlie Daniels just a minute ago was one of the nicest guys in the world. There have been stories for years, and I'm not going to ask you to, to give up any personal confidences, but there have been stories for years about Ray Stevens, who was this very famous country comedian, who, like most comedians, have the reputation of of not being real happy behind the scenes. I wonder if there were uh, musicians, famous folks that you met uh, that, that maybe put that smile on on stage, but behind the scenes, they are pretty miserable human beings. Ray wasn't, I wouldn't say he was miserable, but you could tell that, uh, that uh, on stage is where he needed to be. He didn't need to have a microphone shoved in his face and asking questions. And you could tell that, and you get the sense, you know how far you can go with, with the artist. You can, you can read them pretty well after about four or five minutes. You'll know that if they want to be left alone. And I think Ray was one of those guys, hey, let me do my thing. I'd rather do that than, than, than uh, do these things behind the scene. I did ask him what was the more difficult song to write, a serious song or a novelty song. And, of course, he said uh, the serious song was much more difficult. The thing about Ray Stevens, he was a dynamite writer and singer, but what a musician. I remember on the song Misty, which was released on a 45 RPM, the old classic Misty song. He played every instrument on that, on that record, and he did that a lot. He did his sessions. He played piano, guitar, bass, drums, whatever. He was an amazing, amazing musician, along with an amazing ability to, to write and sing. Quite, quite a talent in Ray Stevens, and he's, he's still performing. You met uh, Garth Brooks, and uh, I have also spent some time with Garth, and I've always found him to be uh, one of the, the nicest guys in the entertainment business, and, and certainly he's, he's got a longevity now of almost 30 years. What do you remember about a young Garth Brooks? Because you met him pretty early on. I met Garth Brooks. Uh, it was uh, right when he was beginning to break. It was at the, uh, the Country Music Association uh, convention in Nashville, Tennessee. I remember he wore a big, long, uh, long rider's coat, like the, the, the Western, Western uh, actors wore, where the Western cowboys wore. And he was so down to earth, he was drinking a lot of water that day, I know, to keep hydrated. And he was just starting to break out, but he was posing for pictures, signing autographs. Wonderful, wonderful guy. And the thing about Garth Brooks, and I've often said this, in his day, Hank Williams Jr., now this is in his day and in this time period, Hank Williams Jr. was the first superstar of country music, using the word superstar in that era of time. In Garth Brooks' era of time, he is the superstar of his era of time because his ability to perform and to get a crowd involved with what he's doing, he's the best at that. I've never seen better showmanship on stage than Garth Brooks. He not only is a nice guy off stage, but he's a dynamite performer on stage. And you ask Garth a question, he, uh, he, uh, he will tell you like he sees it, and that's, that's the way it should be. There was a song that he recorded uh, when the thunder rolls. It was about the marital abuse. And uh, uh, CMT, uh, they, they banned it from their airplay because of that. And, he was very disappointed in that. He said he didn't, he didn't depict any of that, but that's what the song was about, was a marital, marital problems. But uh, he was very concerned about that, and he was very sad that they would take that video off the air because it was so popular. But Garth, yeah, like, like you said, he was, uh, is, and anytime he wants to come back, he'll be a bigger star as what he was when he, when he settled back and said, hey, I want to I lay off for, 
for a few months. He's he's got that 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 kind of charisma. No, you're right, and and was fearless. I, I remember taking my staff when uh, I ran a radio station in Las Vegas for CBS, and they we, we got the radio station all the way up to number one in the market. I was program director, and we took my whole team, all the the air talent, out to the uh, Billboard Music Awards at the MGM uh, Arena there. And Garth was scheduled to perform that night, and and Louis flew in from the rafters. He he came in and down uh, over the audience, landed on the stage, and and played the show. It was just incredible. Oh, hey, it's, it's, I got to ask you about the ladies of country music because you have sure. been around some some incredibly talented, but also some of the most beautiful country music performers of all time. You know, from Crystal Gale to Barbara Mandrell. I mean, the, the list goes on and on. Jeannie Seeley, Jeannie C. Riley. W were you ever were you ever smitten with one of these uh, legendary country music ladies where you just went? my goodness, that's the most beautiful woman I've ever been around. And you got sort of stage fright. It was tough for you to talk, even though you, you talk for a living. Uh, Crystal Gale. Now, I was with Crystal Gale when she was with a small recording label in Nashville. And she just kind of, she's the, the, the sister of Loretta Lynn. And uh, she, uh, she always got next to me. I always thought she was just the cutest little girl. And she was a little girl back then, too. This was back in the 70s before she hit. But uh, Crystal Gale, uh, Dolly Parton, uh, what, a, what a pistol, Dolly Parton. Uh, in my book, there's a full story about her and the true story about the Porter Wagner and Dolly Parton breakup. There's many stories about that, but I've got it in Dolly's own words how that breakup occurred and why it occurred, which is very interesting reading. Uh, none really, uh, really uh, cuts me. If, if anyone touched me and I got a little tongue tied, it would, it would be a young Crystal Gale, I believe. She was just a cute girl and I knew, she, she thanked me after I introduced her on show, she on stage, she said, thank you for not introducing me as Loretta Lynn's sister. Wow. said, everywhere I go, it's Loretta Lynn's sister. I said, well, you got to do it on your own. She said, well, I'm proud to be Loretta's sister, but I do want to do it on my own. I remember her telling me that after the, uh, after the show. There's some old radio memorabilia. You remember in your, your broadcasting days, was there ever a, uh, uh, a broadcasting stunt? You know, radio folks for years and years have done things to grab attention that, that stands out in your mind as just sort of the, the, the most out there radio stunt that you ever participated in. I did one one time at a uh, at a car dealership, and uh, you could have threw a beer can and not hit a soul. There wasn't <laughs> there wasn't anybody in that showroom, nobody on the lot, and I was preaching the high heavens about you got to get in here and take advantage of these deals. No one was there, and the management and ownership they were getting real concerned. And I thought, man, I'm going to do something here that's going to going to shake things up. So I got on the next break and I said, ladies and gentlemen, you've got to be a part of this party. They're standing wall to wall and treetop tall. We're having trouble getting them in the door. They're everywhere. They know a good deal when they hear a good deal from Lou Dobbins. You can't let these specials pass by you. If you need a car, you need Harry Green Chevrolet. Not a soul there, but as soon as I said that, here came the cars like they were coming off the turnpike. So we filled the place after that little stunt. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, there's yeah, took, a longer time than standing around in a car dealership doing a live broadcast and nobody comes through the door. That's when the minutes creep by. Oh, they, they creep by and you got the management <laughs> and the ownership looking at you like, like what's going on. But that, I think that was about, I think about the wildest stunt. I, well, I did a lot of on-air stunts on radio that, that got a lot of people talking, uh, but that was just part of the shtick that I had. Some, some yeah. crazy stuff. Lou Dobbins is our guest today on Zoom into Books and, and also the Big Time Talker podcast powered by Speaker Match. You stayed in West Virginia. You chose to make that your home and, and to build a career there and, and marry that marketplace. And it all came back to you uh, several years ago when you were inducted not only into the West Virginia Country Music Hall of Fame, but the West Virginia Broadcasters Hall of Fame. Was there a time early in your career when when you sort of looked outside the mountain state and said, you know, gosh, I could, I could maybe make it in Nashville. I could make it in Cincinnati. I could make it in, in a big market. Were you ever tempted to move away? Burke, I had, I had multiple offers 
And every offer that I got that I thought was a serious offer, I would usually go and visit an offer in Atlanta, Georgia. I went to Atlanta. Atlanta's a nice place to visit, but I didn't want to live there. Traffic was horrendous. Uh, there were offers all over the place, and I went to a lot of places, and it just wasn't geared for me. It, it, it just wasn't the same same uh, surroundings that I had in West Virginia. And the only place that I would have ended up in, and I did eventually end up in Nashville promoting, but uh, Nashville was the only place that I, and if I would have got a serious offer from Nashville, and I came close a couple times at WSM, uh, I would have went. But uh, the other places, they weren't me. Uh, Burke, they were just great places to visit, but they weren't home. And there's no place like the hills of West Virginia. And I'd made my name for, I made a name for myself. I would have had to start all over again. I already had a firm foothold in this part of the country in broadcasting and notoriety. So. I, I I turned them all down. I had many offers, but it just I just said no. I, I'm I'm happy where I'm at. And and it's surprising for right here in Clarksburg. Very surprising. These interviews, 99.9 percent .9 of them came right from Clarksburg with these entertainers performing in Clarksburg. If not in Clarksburg, they were over over the uh, over the phone. But we had them all coming through here, and I emceed all the shows, uh, promoted most of the shows and uh, had the access where I was afraid going somewhere else, it wouldn't be that way. And I couldn't, I couldn't stand that. I could not stand uh, not, being able, not being able to do that. After all these years doing it, Lou, and, and talking to all the folks you've talked to, what still gets you excited to get up in the morning? What, what do you enjoy? What makes you want to put your feet on the floor? The excitement is trying to get another interview because uh, I'm still interviewing. You helped me a while back with Steve Earle, which turned out really well. I interviewed Charlie Pride last week, the country music legend, got Bill Anderson, the man who's written more country hit records than anybody before or after him. I got Bill coming up in the next week or so. It's the thoughts of going after the biggest names I can to do interviews. That's what gets me going this day and time. It's the interviews and doing what we're doing today on Zoom. This is exciting for me. I get to tell my own story. But that's what gets me going. And after Bill, I don't know, I got works in with Chris Christopherson and Willie Nelson, some other people. But uh, this day and time at my age and with this COVID-19, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, getting up and thinking about who am I going to call today? What agent am I going to talk to to try to, to try to get an interview? Some of them are more difficult than others. Some of them are plain, plain no, but uh, the, still the opportunities there. You, uh, you talked to some legends, many legends now who are no longer with us. And I wonder if you look ahead and you think, you know, where will this audio live on uh, after I'm gone? Because, you know, you just talked about your good friend, Charlie Daniels, who we tragically yeah. lost. And many of those legendary country music artists are no longer with us. I'm assuming you have recordings of most of these interviews. So what's going to happen with those those recordings? I, I, I'm going to leave all that to my son, but... That, that was the most challenging part of this book, you know, writing this book. I took all those interviews, and most of them I kept. Some of them I didn't keep, and I really regret that, but I didn't do it. But the challenging part for the book, I had to transcribe all those audio interviews, all the words into print, and that was time-consuming. took a while to do it, but it, but it worked out real well. But those interviews, and I've got them stacked to the ceiling, that's going to be up to my son. I told him, I said, these are yours after I'm gone. If you want to put them in a, in a hall somewhere or country music hall of things talked about wanting to, to get some of them, but that's, that's totally up to you. But there's a lot of them, uh, Burke from Hank Williams, Jr. Uh, you, you name them. And I, I'm back in the golden age of country, they're in this book and everything in this book is a story of life. It's true life. There's nothing fiction about it. What you see actually happened. It will be an entertaining book, an educational book, and uh, there are stories about my early childhood and the path that I took that brought me to the ultimate thank yous, the West Virginia Country Music Hall of Fame and, uh, and the Broadcasters Hall of Fame. But uh, all of that's, as we say, in, in the book. You know, there's, there's an element of inspiration that I got when I read the book, and, and I want to touch on that as we get close to wrapping up with our guest today, Lou Dobbins, the author behind the microphone. And that is that truly in the United States of America, anybody can do anything that they're willing to put the hard work, the blood, sweat, and tears into. 
And here you are, a kid from West and West Virginia, who has accomplished something that's pretty incredible. And, and I'm sure when you started out and you did your first interview, you never imagined that some five decades later, you would have this incredible treasure trove of uh, interviews with historic artists, some of the biggest, most legendary names in the, in the country music business. So, so I want to put it to you this way. What would you say to a young person who might be watching or listening right now who says, gosh, you know, I'm from nowhere, Arkansas, and there's no chance I'm going to be able to do anything with my life. Um, Lou Dobbins, you did an awful lot with your life from humble beginnings. What would you say to that young person who's just starting out and trying to find their way through things? It's, uh, it's a lot more difficult now than what it was when I broke into the business. When, when I started in the business, I even had to take a federal test. You had to have a third class license. You had to know something about what you were doing on air as a federal test. For anybody that wants to get into this business, you don't have to have the test anymore. You don't have to have a license. But you've got to just work, work on your own with a, with a tape recorder. Record yourself over and over. Take it to someone that knows a little bit about radio. Let them critique what you have. And just keep knocking on those doors. If you believe in yourself, you're going to sooner or later get some response if you hang in there and make yourself good enough to, to receive the response. But you got to really want it. you got to just eat, drink, breathe, and sleep. That's exactly it. And if you want it, go after it. Uh, the worst thing can happen, no. But don't accept that. And do you believe that that's, uh, that's true for pretty much whatever your passion point is? For you, it was music and interviews and uh, doing country radio. But do you think anybody from anywhere can, can make their dreams happen in America still in 2020 the way you did in 1966? Going to be very, very difficult, uh, especially with this COVID-19. But uh, there's only a few of the old timers like me left. We lost, lost Bill Mack, a great country music voice of country music from down in Texas here a couple weeks ago. There's only a few of, of us left. It's, it's, it's going to be difficult because radio is not the way it was when I, when I first broke in. It was personalized. It's not so much personalized now. But if you've got the earning to get in the business and you want it bad enough, you know, just, just go for it. That's all you can do is just you know, practice with your readings and tape yourself and, and go knocking on some doors and say, hey, give a listen to me. And, Eventually, you'll get someone to listen, and then hopefully you might end up in this business. Lord help you. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. Lou Dobbins, our guest today. The book is Behind the Microphone, and it chronicles his incredible five-decade career. Lou is a West Virginia Country Music Hall of Fame member, also a member of the West Virginia Broadcasters Hall of Fame. And up next, maybe the, the West Virginia Music Hall of Fame. And, and uh, I just hope at that point he'll still take my calls. Lou Dobbins, thank you for being on the program today. Burr, thank you, my friend. You're the best. The book is Behind the Microphone. It's available from Headline Books at headlinebooks.com, at amazon.com, barnesandnoble.com. If you're a country music aficionado, a fan of broadcasting, check it out. It's Lou Dobbins, Behind the Microphone. For our friends at Headline Books, I'm Burke Allen. This has been a special simulcast Zoom into Books and the Big Time Talker podcast sponsored by speakermatch.com. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Now go out there and Make it a great day. Bye, everybody.